I'm going to uh, talk about understanding your software development. And how many of you here develop software? Just a show of hands. They were whoever. OK, some of you are not awake. Um, <laughs> the obligatory slide. Um, motivation. Um, software development productivity is affected by many factors. Um, and most of them are not measurable directly. Uh, and so far in this track, we've been focusing on concepts and best practices and um, a lot of um, experiences um, on, in this particular um, talk. Um, I'm going to actually talk about supporting best practices through software tools. Um, and tools are meant to be used, so they are research tools, though, so be gentle. Um, so they will be available to you. They are already available to you to play with. Um, with your own software. So motivation, why am I talking about tools that um, analyze software development? Um, did I just make that up? Why should I be even involved in this? Um, there are other people who have looked at this, um, and in particular, uh, what predicts a software developers productivity paper that I'm citing here went through, and you're not supposed to be able to see this, so don't try. Uh, you can get the paper, um, but it went through many, many, many software developers in an um, interview a sort of survey type um, a study that asked them what made them most productive. Um, so now we're going to pause a little bit, and you guys are going to write down what you think makes you most productive in your software development. It has to be just one thing, sorry. Uh, so you have to pick. It doesn't have to be code related at all. Could be. You know, how you feel, your environment, coworkers, uh, bosses, whatever. Uh, just think broadly. What is the one top thing that makes you really good at uh, developing good software on a, any given day, if you can think of it? Can you think of that? Yes? No? Any examples before I reveal what Google thinks? Yes? Uh, my programming environment. Your programming environment makes you happy? Uh, yeah, I, I do like mine too very much. Um, yeah. Having a well-defined goal and good idea of how to get it. Yes, a goal plan, that is great. Yeah, exactly. Um, anybody else want to volunteer something different? Yeah. A few free distractions. Ooh, yeah, that, that helps, I think. Um, Caffeine. Caffeine, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Sleep. Sleep. Sometimes. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> all right. Music, whatever. Your, uh, your teammates, maybe, if you're programming on the same project, you know, you could. So anyway, a lot of things, most of which are not really measurable. Um, the study found that the most correlated things uh, to productivity were job enthusiasm, peer support of new ideas, and useful feedback about job performance. So, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about any of those. Um, sorry. So the thing, though, that I'm going to point out, the environments and other such things did show up in the survey with pretty positive, I mean, with, with, with not insignificant um, correlation. And actually, this one, was the top one at Google, best tools and practices, right? So environment goes in that. Um, the other software-related factors that were also um, used in the study, uh, bug finding, efficient and effective, process um, well-defined, reusing code rather than copying it, um, risk mitigation of different kinds. I am going to talk about those things. Um, and then negative impact on productivity, uh, you require uh, data storage, can't help you. Uh, extremely complex software can help you a little bit, and so on. So read the paper if you're curious. Pretty cool stuff. Um, the conclusions were that um, basically those non-tangible, I mean non-measurables, um, are the most important, um, but uh, Software development practices um, are important, and feedback is important. And so I'm going to kind of stretch this conclusion to say that my tool provides some sort of feedback, and therefore, maybe, will lead to better productivity. So just to summarize, um, we are trying to not measure motivation and enthusiasm, but we do have a lot of data. 
We have a lot of artifacts and metadata associated with development. And so we are betting that instead of not using any data, we can use some data to inform software development processes and just how you do anything. Um, and this is basically, hopefully, um, going to work. And I will talk about how we implement this a little bit, but also mostly focus on examples. And uh, the framework that does this is basically taking development data that's available, which I'll go through in a bit. Um, there is a GitHub here uh, that you can go to. Um, and there's some projects that are going to show up uh, when I talk, and also when you go to some of the examples. Um, and the two parts of this module are, first, we're going to talk about development metadata uh, mining and what you can do with that. And the second part is going to focus on just code. All right. Now, uh, development data mining. So what is that data? It's basically anything you can get from Git, um, which is quite a lot. And also Git hosting services, which add on to that. There's extra metadata you get from other parts of, um, uh, that are not really native to Git. And what we want to do is, other than swamp you with um, boatloads of data, is to find out, um, first of all, are there interesting questions that we can answer with this data? Formulate some of those questions and try to answer them that actually will um, affect your code development in some way. Questions, what questions? Those are just some um, questions just to get you going. Um, you can think of your own questions. In fact, I would love it if you have more questions to, to ask. Some of them may be answerable, some not. But just to give you ideas of what we've already thought of. Um, for example, if I adopt some practice, how would some productivity related metric be affected? Like maybe um, uh, I will show you or code. It, couldn't, it doesn't have to be productivity related. It could be also code quality related. How active is the developer community for larger projects? You may have a lot of developers and some of them are more active than others. Um, and in some, other, uh, in some parts of the code more active than other parts. So we can show that. Um, what parts of the code are in most uh, um, in need of review? How do you rely on individual developers? How much? And so on. We do a little bit of natural language processing based analysis. That's probably not as developed as something else, uh, as, as, as Git and, and code analysis. So I'm not going to advertise that too much, but it's possible. OK, um, so instead of coming up with our own questions to answer first, um, we ran into this little book by accident, which is a study by uh, Pluralsight. Uh, they're a big uh, company that does software engineering consulting. And so they went, um, they've worked with many companies, not research software. And they have uh, identified those 20 patterns that they see over and over and over and over and over in software development teams. And not all of them fit the research software environment, so we have to adapt. But some of them are pretty familiar, I think. So we have used this book as an inspiration to do more. And you can grab it. It's free. It's very small. Now, they don't automate anything. They just say, if you observe blah, 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 do blah, blah, blah. So what we're trying to do is actually, first of all, figure out, does this fit the HPC software development um, processes and so on, open source in particular? Uh, can we actually find those patterns with data mining? And if we do find them, can we use the results in some meaningful way? So that's a few examples I'm going to show. Um, example metrics uh, more as sort of, again, to give you ideas. Uh, we have, of course, the raw data that you get from Git, but then you can derive things uh, such as different types of rates, bug fix rates, and, and so on, different measurements of changes. You can start doing a little bit of analysis to find correlations between different metrics. 
uh, rho and derived and so on, and that may uh, give you some important information about what your project is doing. Um, and then um, complexity, the last line there is code complexity. That's a whole big <laughs> uh, set of metrics on its own, and I'll talk about that in the second part. All right, so diving right into Domain Champion. Um, that's one of the patterns in this book, and it's actually similar to um, uh, some other types of things that you might have heard of, and I'll refer to them a little bit later, but basically the way it's defined there is Domain Champion is an expert in a particular area of the code base. They know nearly everything there is to know, um, and so they're just really, um, the main, the main um, owner of that piece of software, right? Um, so how many of you are domain champions in your own opinion and your projects that you're working on? I mean, if you're the only author, by definition, you are the domain <laughs> champion. So I want to see all these only author names. Yes, there you go. Um, so that's also related to the bus factor metric or truck or other morbid things. So you guys have a terrible bus factor because you're the only ones. Um, so the, the idea is if you get hit by a bus, your project dies. So why, I like this better because it's a positive thing, not involving dying. Um, and so domain champion, uh, why do we care? Uh, well, a domain champion could be extremely productive because they know everything. Um, and could produce amazing um, code, but also uh, there could be code quality issues. I'll go into that next. And then what happens if the domain champion happens to leave, not necessarily hit by a truck? Um, uh, the negative impact on quality is that uh, you might um, you might not have anybody qualified to review your decisions, right? If you know, if you're the main or only person who knows everything. So that's, that's something to watch for. All right, so how do we detect the thing? Um, I'll show this kind of plot a little bit um, rep repetitively because you'll get used to it. There are other ways to visualize any of these things. Uh, but this heat map um, is showing changes. Um, and the x-axis is developers. The y-axis is files, and we're only showing the most active files and developers in that time period, which arbitrarily was chosen to be February of 2021 for that project. And it's looking at a simple metric, lines of code changed. Um, so you can see uh, some high values here. Uh, and you have to look for what you're looking for is some file that has only one developer, like this one, and this is the domain champion for, if you do file level, you can do also directory level or some other coarser granularity, uh, but definitely this developer, whoever that is, is the domain champion of a couple of things. This happens to be spec. Oh, good, Todd's not here. All right, um, so I can, Oh, no, Todd is here. I don't have the names, though. I, I know where you are in some of the other plots. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. OK, so, uh, so this is just to get you used to the plot. You can sort of see quickly uh, for any given time period uh, what's happening. And then you can decide to do nothing. Maybe you want to praise the domain champion, give him a raise, or you know, teach somebody else how to do stuff. Um, so um, this just tells you what else you could do in terms of the granularity. You can consider uh, arbitrary collections of files, but directories are easier. Uh, different change metrics I'll talk about in a little bit. You can pick any period. And you could do subteams, not quite implemented, but if somebody asks, I'll do it. <laughs> so this is still per developer. Um, so what should we do when we detect this or measure it? Maybe we do it regularly, right? Um, and um, it could be very productive. Uh, there may not be uh, ability to provide feedback by others, like I mentioned, because they don't know enough. Uh, it may not be sustainable. Um, the domain champion can get tired of their domain. So you could do things like uh, bring in new people, 
um, give the domain champion something else to do. Uh, um, and then one bad thing that is definitely bad in larger projects is uh, shown here. This is projects. So this project, which I will not name, um, has one person making 80% of the commits. Probably not a great idea in, in you know, non-tiny projects. Um, OK, next example, Todd, question. Yeah, on the, so on the commits thing, do you consider different merge strategies over time? Because one, one thing we noticed with SPAC is when we started, it was just me pushing everything yeah, no, we, we um, I realized this is what's happening. There is one person, there was one project where somebody fixed all the bugs. Yeah. I mean, it was a non-trivial amount of bugs on one sunny day, um, you know, and I realized it wasn't that one person. They're just the ones that closed the issues, right? So we had similar things with other data. And merging, merge workflows look different from three days to squat, so. Yeah, uh, so it could be, uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to tease out who really did what. Um, so this is looking at commits, however they were annotated. And if you change them, then that's what we get. All right, so high churn um, is basically code that is rewritten or deleted or being modified in any way slightly after being written. And uh, we extend this a little bit to also worry about by multiple people, not just the same person. And we want to find what files uh, have unusually large or frequent changes, how many developers are involved, um, why. Uh, could be fine, could be great, people collaborating on some cool stuff, um, or could be people fighting with each other and changing each other's work, um, and um, may also indicate a need for refactoring. All right, so I show a similar style plot, uh, but focusing it differently now, deciding on the granularity again, actors, time period, and what churn metric we're gonna use. And so here we're looking at um, those kinds of changes that are frequent um, over a short period of time or a long period, this case project. And so um, the high churn things naturally are gonna cluster sort of toward the left and up. And so, the way we visualize it, but you could choose to do other things. And so what I would do with, with SPAC is look at all the files here and see if that's expected. And, and if so, move on. If not, um, do something about it. And yes, this is Todd. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were gonna protect the guilty person. Well, he's sitting there and he hasn't killed me yet, so. Yeah, it's kind of, it's also hard for spec because like I'll do all the, I do a lot of the menial changes to all the packages, but I don't actually work on any of the packages. Oh, but, but yeah, I'll show, so this guy uh, here, the, the, so that's the interesting thing that I'll show later. This is a still lines of code changed and, and you'll see the real changes a little bit that show that better, but you're still the main guy, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, uh, right, so consider refactories, more developers, replacing Todd. Um, all right, um, I'll come back to the change metric and then you'll see a little bit different uh, results. Uh, last pattern, in the zone, that's a fun one. When are uh, people most productive? Um, and in particular top contributors, I really don't care about somebody who's made like two commits in their lifetime. So we only focus on the top. And we look at uh, the different times of day and are they consistent? during those times of day. And you want to also look for things that may indicate people are getting uh, in danger of burnout and not having work life uh, or life. Um, and so how do we look at that? Uh, so we look at the heat map again because they're handy. And on the y-axis is weekday, on the x-axis is hour. Uh, you can do other time periods, you'll see that next. We have um, a different difference metric, which I'm going to explain later. Um, this is cosine difference, which is more accurate on lines of code in terms of how hard it is to make that change. Um, and then we just uh, count and visualize. And so for this particular project, uh, it, we see that we have peak times, sort of during a regular workday. 
we've done our best to make sure time zones are local to the committers, but you know, there's only so much you can do, so you can expect a little bit of funkiness around that. Uh, now that's one project, um, and here are 12 projects, and you can see how different they can be, right? Um, you can have very different patterns, and let me find one that's kind of weird. Um, yeah, so here, I mean, I don't know what's going on. They are like working on Sunday most. No, I think we start on Monday. This is Monday, yeah. Um, but then there's some that are pretty normal looking and some that actually take weekends off, which is great. Um, and some that don't. And uh, so computed again uh, in a very similar way. So here is a agglomerated plot of many projects um, all in one heat map uh, where, uh, yeah, I think we took all the ACP, but maybe at that time it was about a dozen DOE ECP projects um, and we concluded that most, most contributions were happening after regular work hours. We broke it down a little bit coarser grain. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say about that other than maybe people have too many meetings or distractions or, or whatever, um, but it's, it's also a little um, disturbing. And the things that people can do in response to this is to acknowledge the people who are consistently uh, working well during normal hours especially and um, maybe watch for people who are unable to control their, themselves and, and are in danger of burnout and do something about it. All right, uh, any questions so far about patterns stuff? I'll show a little bit about how it's implemented, not too much. Um, there is a, oops, sorry. Uh, there is a bit.ly, but also there are links um, all over the place. Um, I'm sorry for the multiple URLs. I tried to update it. We gave this thing a name, and so you're going to see uh, Gramcat in some places and Ideas.io in some other places, so that's because the name is quite new. Uh, but it's the same repo. And um, the idea um, here is to provide a super simple interface to the data. So if you wanted to develop, um, if you wanted to just study your own project's data, other people's projects, you have a very low uh, learning curve. And underneath, uh, what we do is we, uh, we constantly suck in uh, get data into a database. Eventually, we'll run out of space. Uh, then we'll beg uh, for the projects that we are currently interested in. And we then are able to define patterns to search for. There's a visualizer component that you see being used here that generated all the pictures in this um, presentation and then some more. So initial import of data can take a while. We did Linux at one point, which, yeah, it takes a bit. Um, and analysis is also quite uh, slow on that. But all the DOE projects are fairly quick. All right, um, I'm going to talk about change estimates. So I've shown a couple of different ones so far, and their uh, lines of code changed and cosine difference. So lines of code is what most of the literature and commercial tools look at. Um, we use a lot of automated tools to reformat and do other code changes and code transformations um, to very large numbers of file um, of, of lines. Um, and I don't want that to be a measure of productivity of a human uh, in any way. And so uh, we try to look for other things like what is likely um, the most accurate uh, reflection of what a human had to type in at least, I mean, and think about. Um, so we just, uh, it's not, you know, I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's better than lines of code. We look at the um, uh, text distance metrics, which is, again, not perfect because they're not meant for software, but I think they work uh, pretty well. And so we look at the code before and the code after the change and then measure the distance. So if you just went and reformatted it, you're going to get a number very close to zero 
right? That's no difference. Um, but if you actually wrote new code, it's going to be a number much closer to one if you scale it from zero to one, right? It doesn't matter how many lines you wrote. Okay, now we also scale it by the number of lines because you don't want somebody to write one line of code and now they're the star of the project, right? So you have to do that too. Um, so you can see the plots are very different. You have the top here looking lines at lines of code and this one same exact same data looking at the cosine difference. And so get different types of information. Uh, and because I don't want to bore you with heat maps, I mean, you can do a lot of other types of visualization. Suppose you want to look at trends, what, what, what's happening with different metrics over time. Of course, you can do that. Uh, what happens is the data is very messy. Uh, what you do, if you plot it directly, you get this you know, heart attack plot for pretty much any project. So that doesn't tell you much. And so there's a bunch of smoothing functions that you can do, uh, moving averages of various durations. Um, and that helps you see if you're sort of steady or something is growing or something is shrinking, so the usual. Um, and then you can also combine the bubble plots here showing how the different change metrics um, are, you know, can be used to interpret what's going on. Uh, like this little bubble here means that a large number of lines were changed, but not significantly. And so if your code, um, if your code history has a lot of little bubble changes, you know, somebody's doing some <laughs> committing of automatically generated code. I mean, I can guarantee it. So maybe that's uh, what you want. But then this, this thing here is indicating that a uh, more significant change was happening. That one, yes. Okay. Uh, you could also try to, um, I mean, you know your own projects, right? So you're not going to look for significant events, or maybe, but we don't know. So these are projects uh, that we didn't uh, create. And so it's kind of fun to look for significant events, but you can go backwards and identify significant events and see how they affect your development productivity. Here, for example, there's 2020, um, hap some, some big thing happening, right? Real big changes. Uh, then you can zoom in a little bit and um, probably not too coincidentally, it's right around supercomputing. Same with this one. So a lot of the DOE projects have big bursts of productivity, right? Before or after, just around supercomputing. It's not Thanksgiving. Um, so there's that. Um, and then maybe we should have more supercomputings. Um, and so then there's the, you know, anomalies that you want to see, well, did they affect my project and how? And this is just looking at 2019, 2020, and the average, which is just the dotted uh, blue, I think, no, which is the green is the average. Um, and obviously, the brown is 2020. And you don't really, I mean, for different projects, um, it seems like, for example, project two here had a pretty amazing 2020. You know, they were stuck at home doing nothing but this. Um, and then other projects, not so much. They kind of had the blahs. So I don't know what you do with this, but it shows you how, um, how they weathered those events. And this is a little more useful. It's a little more, um, doesn't have as much automation as we like, but we are working on it, is to try to quantify where your development is being, um, uh, you know, where, where your uh, time is going. And it's trying to uh, have a few simple categories and label mostly automatically once you've defined some rules, all the parts of the code to belong to one of these categories. And then look over time how much you're doing in each category, right? And so what you can see is that uh, uh, Flash realized the tests were important. Those are full applications, actually, that they're writing here and running. And you can see that explode. Um, QDP, XX, no, not so much. 
uh, but they do really believe in documentation, obviously. And then you can see some things that are missing from some projects, like uh, this. And I have to, with a disclaimer that I did the pattern label generation, right? So I could have misinterpreted some of these categories, but um, I think I was pretty careful. She wasn't thinking about tests. <laughs> no, <laughs> this is backing her up. Look at that. Yes. This is like they're living it. Um, Petsy? Yeah, Petsy is is a little tough. I mean, actually, I do have Petsy, don't I? I don't know why it's not here. No, no, because this was full application code. So we weren't for this particular study. We weren't doing libraries. Oh, that's right. We weren't doing libraries for this one. I can do it for Petsy too, um, because it's the same. Thing and I actually know how to label it. So, all right. Uh, any questions so far? Because I'm going to show an unrelated example. Nope. All right. Uh, so, this is a really, really, really new tool that we're uh, working with uh, FlashX and hopefully other teams soon to help actually actively improve developer processes and eff efficiency. So, not just mine the data, but actually do something. And it's called Meerkat. Um, and the way um, it works is to make your pull requests or merge requests, if you're a GitLab person, um, more efficient and better. And what it would do is it gets triggered by just you submitting a pull request. It will actually analyze the file changes and it will generate a little tiny report with some feedback. Um, right now, it's looking at documentation and testing. And, but you can imagine how you can expand that to other things. And then it does some other checks that are already part of your testing. So um, the current things that it wants uh, to help you with are Check if your documentation is in there, exists. Um, does it actually match the code? In, in terms of, suppose you change some function signature, right? Did you uh, update the doc documentation? No, yes, no, so it will try to detect that. Um, some tests may no longer apply or be not quite right. It will try to detect that too. Uh, it would also suggest labels. Uh, to add to your pull request, and it would also hunt down people who may know more about that code part of the code base. That's a little bit controversial about how to include those people without knowing them too much. All right. How do you, how do you get the labels? Oh, the labels? Um, I don't know, actually. That's a Steve question, so he works uh, with us on that. I can ask. That's kind of new. That first factor is a pot. But yeah. Based on, like which files it touched, so we just have some. <coughs> yeah, I'm not sure how they compute them for this, so but I'll find out. Um, okay, suppose there was a problem, right? Instead of just complaining about it and letting you forget or overwrite it and move on, it will actually allow you to edit it right then and there if you so desire and fix. Uh, for example, if it's a small little change in the documentation, you will be able to just do it and. We don't actually commit or push to anybody's uh, branches, but um, you can download a patch. That's about as far as it gets. Um, this is fully optional. You don't have to actually use it. Um, and so now we also can look for files that reference the changes, the change function, and make sure that they are also compliant. Now, you probably don't want to change the test. You may want to rethink your new function interface, or maybe you want to change the test, in which case you can. Um, and then another thing it does is lets you, in, lets you see a summarized uh, view of all the problems um, that it found in the file history. And I think, um, so <laughs> early feedback here is that some of that is pretty useful because it can point out things that are going to be detected probably by CI, but much, much later. So you're not going to be waiting for hours just to find out that you had this problem. It's going to tell you a little bit earlier so you can fix it. 
um, and then spend less time back and forth with CITES. Okay, that's it for Meerkat. It's still very new, but if you think something like that is interesting or exciting, you know, talk to me and we'll, we'll see. This still kind of uh, trying to make it a more general purpose tool. All right, so moving on to code analysis because that's exactly how much time I wanted to have for it. <laughs> Any questions so far on the Git related part? No. All right. Analyzing code. So uh, why, why look at the code itself? Um, well, I mean, most of you already know uh, you want to avoid bugs of all kinds of, uh, of, all kinds of bugs. Um, you want to make your code um, beautiful, readable, maintainable, etc. right? So those are the, the high level reasons. Here we have a bunch of more specific reasons. Um, let's see, how many of you have used any sort of static checkers or use it more regularly? Quite a few of you. And can you yell out what you use? Clank ID, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it means, CCLS, it's just integrated in general. Yeah, okay. And of course, those of you using IDEs probably have some stuff running automatically, um, one hopes, and so on. Um, so there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of rules, there are a lot of resources, there are a lot of tools, it's hard to kind of wade through them. There's actually an entire standard um, that is aimed at defi defining um, code quality metrics that, in a way that makes it um, automatable to measure those metrics, right? So it's not just the researchers going off and doing their thing and creating yet another metric to publish a paper. But, you know, this is sort of a industry, therefore money-related activity. All right. Um, because bugs are expensive, as we already mentioned, uh, and humans are expensive. So, um, so here, uh, this is not news to some of you, but there are many tools just sitting out there ready to be used. And you should try them because they're very low effort to try. Um, and um, I will show an example of scan check in a second, but you know, it's wrapping something else that you can also use directly such as Clang Analyze. Um, it's a little bit confusing when you see a bunch of tools like this. There's the Clang Static Analyzer, there's Clang Tidy. What is the difference? Um, some of the, so Clang Tidy is doing more, um, you know, local checks, right? Naming conventions, that kind of thing, right? Um, now the Clang Static Analyzer is going to do much more analysis it's going to build control flow graphs. It's going to try to, so it's, it's really a more serious tool if you want to do bug uh, sort of oriented um, static analysis, right? So you probably want to do both um, in, in bigger projects. Um, and then there's poor Fortran. How many of you do Fortran? I, I know you're doing Fortran, but how many, how, anybody Fortran um, programming here? Oh, right. that's a lot of Fortran customers. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> Not. Um, it, <laughs> it's a huge headache because Flang is always behind um, Clang, but okay, we're working on it. And um, linters are more limited and so on. So yeah, there's tooling, but it's a lot less. But also Fortran is a nicer language, so there's less to be done. Um, all right. So what do I uh, mean when I say, oh, use code quality tools? Well, suppose uh, this was stolen from some project. That's their workflow. I forgot which project already. But anyway, that's their normal workflow. Um, and I've inserted um, some extra things. And the, the just generic code quality um, tools you can download and use um, are highlighted in blue. Uh, Clang format, Clang tidy, static analyzer. Um, actually, Clang format I don't even use in CI. I mean, that happens in the editing already before you even uh, submit your changes, but suppose you didn't. Um, so you would do Clang format first. You would 
um, apply these to and respond to their feedback, um, then maybe there's some project specific analysis that none of the other tools can handle. Uh, so we have some examples of how to do that. Maybe you have some really weird naming conventions or requirements for calling of things in certain places. And um, then if, once you're happy with the state of this, uh, you move on to actually doing your normal CI testing. And maybe also think of using coverage if it's available for your um, if it's a multi-language system, forget it, but um, okay. So what we try to do is we, we're not going to rewrite Clang tools um, or any other such. In Python, you should be using MyPy and such. Um, what we do is try to make it easier for people to write custom analysis if they really need to do some project-specific checks which uh, I'll show an example of for Petsy. Uh, how do we do it? Um, we mostly do static, but also a little bit of dynamic program analysis. I'll show you what that means and making example analysis so that you can have something to start with. Um, just because not everybody knows what these particular approaches entail, uh, static program analysis is Basically, what um, you're analyzing every possible execution pass, uh, so you're covering the entire program state space, so that's great. But of course, it can't be 100% accurate because there are things that you only know at runtime. And so, dynamic program analysis is extremely exact because you're doing it at runtime, but it does not cover your um, entire state space. So, you know. Uh, not one is, uh, neither one is the best, depends on your, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, examples of static were already given, uh, Valgrind and uh, sanitizers uh, use dynamic analysis for memory, memory uh, problem detection. All right, so here we're going to do a static example with scan build, which is this nice wrapper that basically saves you all the work. How many of you have used scan build already? Why not? <laughs> I mean, if you use CMake, you don't, and, and a few other, and all the, all the, all the tools, um, it's just, it works. Um, and so we put it in front of your normal build commands. It does its thing. Um, and it gives you <laughs> somewhat frightening, if you've never done it before get ready because you know you're going to have 1138 bugs or more or less but you know it's going to report a whole bunch of stuff there are going to be some false negatives obviously and you can prevent it from ever squawking again once you know where they are but uh, or false positives rather false negatives won't show up um, so yeah and it gives you even nice uh, sort of browser based thingies that you can look at and click and it tells you things in sort of okay language um, that makes it understandable what the problem might be. Um, like in this case, um, <laughs> this is one to pay atten attention to. <laughs> Signed value is garbage or undefined. You know, you choose how to focus on these things. So what we want to do is prioritize, but we haven't implemented that yet. So you just take whatever this gives you. Um, too much information. So yeah, definitely something else is needed on top to make this a little more sane, especially in the beginning when people feel overwhelmed. But ideally you do this uh, regularly enough so you wouldn't have many. Uh, so project specific things. Uh, do you need to be a compiler expert to implement new program checks? And I don't think so. I mean, you might disagree after you look at some code. Um, but um, we want to do our own little AST-based checks, which are not so hard when you learn the matching, pattern matching idea. And uh, I won't dwell on dynamic, but it lets you use Python, which is nice. Um, all right, example, Petsy 
Um, people here know Petsy, hopefully use it, have heard of it. Earlier this week, Petsy? Yes, good. Um, this is in their developer style. We did not change anything. Um, the rules are a subset of that uh, set of rules of the developer uh, style guide. And there are things like, um, oh, you shall not um, declare function in the library, don't put the macro, um, et cetera. So you could look at some of these rules over there. I didn't um, elaborate them. Um, some are naming and some are more like you should be calling something at a particular point in each function, et cetera. And this will go through and figure out where they were broken. And what we can do with combining this with the Git uh, based analysis, because hey, we have all your versions from for forever. Um, this is more than 20 years, um, ever since they started using subversion because CVS was hopeless. Um, I think the first data is from subversion um, and then various other repos, they kept their entire history, which is amazing. Um, and so we start with, you know, uh, just looking through and quantifying changes in each of those rule violations. Um, now, to be fair, they're not doing this regularly. This is way too new. So the goal is that if you're able to do this regularly, then they'll go to zero and they'll stay at zero, right, forever. That's kind of where we're headed with this. All right, so in terms of uh, what the tools do now, a little summary, um, there is uh, types of data analysis. We do get data, commits, changes, lines, files, um, issues and associated metadata for GitHub and GitLab. Oops, sorry, misspelled GitLab. Um, and um, those are the same repo. Code quality is in a different place. And mailing lists, um, this is a little bit older analysis we did, and I don't think it's as robust as everything else, but if you're extremely enthusiastic, there's some um, basically Jupyter notebooks <laughs> that I can give you to play with. Um, so that's basically it for, for my talk. Um, this is the set of tools that let you maybe understand your pro pro uh, processes better and, and maybe guide you in improving them. Um, many, many people contributed to the code because, you know, students, they go away. Um, thank you so much. Any questions? Are you saying the code is written in a domain-specific language? Uh, no. For example, uh, there, there are, in my domain, I'm a cat. So the code that sometimes we need to code, it's to solve a specific problem of a lab yeah. with an accuracy. So you were mentioning that there is this problem about a domain change. But sometimes oh. learning goes Oh, yes. No. Yes. Um, yeah, no. I mean, I, yeah, uh, great point. Um, I actually am familiar with codes where the domain champion is dead and nobody touches the code. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, I'm not sure <laughs> what to do about that. It's, yeah, somebody has to. Um, I think it's fine as long as that's the situation. Um, I guess the cases I was talking about being a problem is when it doesn't have to be, right? It's not this extreme expertise that's needed. It's more uh, resource misallocation, human resource. So yeah, I think in some cases there's just no way to avoid it and that's how it is, especially yeah, when, when very complicated scientific things are involved, right? Um, but if everybody, you know, if, if only one person is um, 
involved in um, more, you know, common things, that's, that's different. Oh, too many. Yeah, well, I know. Um, I don't know. Pick something. Um, I would say <laughs> uh, I would start with the easiest, which is like if you're not already formatting your code, do that. Save your teammates or whoever comes after you some headache. Um, that's easy. Uh, one thing about the formatting, which is a very minor thing, which drives me nuts, is use the same style, please, <laughs> uh, between different people. Um, and then go and start adding more serious checks. I would say clang tidy is sort of next. If you do have conventions, if you don't, maybe you should define some. Um, then uh, if you're a single developer, then who cares? But then maybe the next person will care after you if the code lives on. Um, documentation, right? Uh, put documentation um, and use documentation generators. So I didn't mention it here, but it's definitely important. And in terms of um, memory issues, depends on the code you're writing. Like the Fortran people are just giggling, saying, what? <laughs> memory issues. But if you're writing C or C++, you better be uh, doing. You do? Yeah. Well, your pointers are much more restricted. Anyway. We have a whole paper on memory Okay, then, but I don't know any tools other than the binary ones. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's a, yeah, so, so in terms of the actual um, get data analysis, I realize a lot of the projects are smaller, so they're much more appropriate to um, apply in larger and uh, older projects, right? So that might not be, but um, if you're curious about projects you depend on, you can go spy on them and figure out all the things that are wrong with them for fun, um, so. All right, any other questions? Are we done? All right, thank you. <coughs>